A young man, somewhat unhappy with his life, decides to buy a house in the hope that it will improve his outlook. Little does he know that this house has something of a history. Well, my dear friends, a classic ghost story for you this evening, all the way from Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up, so I could read the stories that you send to me, just for you all. Special shout out for all those long distance drivers out there listening to these stories. I really hope they help the time pass a bit more easy and quickly. Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I write this now as a testament to my existence. The world is too overpopulated, and so many people die every day without anyone knowing they're dead. I refuse for that fate to befall me. I've spent my life up to this point crawling and clawing my way through the vilest filth and muck of humanity, and I'll be damned if this house and its unholy occupant drag me back into the darkness of obscurity. I may end up under some small tombstone in some forgotten cemetery, but with this last will and testament I'm posting up here, combined with my record of what I've learned about the house and the one who resides within, people will remember me as a hero for what I'm about to do. Like every good story, I have to start at the beginning. My name is Kyle Simmons, a 28-year-old manager at a large investment firm located in Chicago. I am alone in this world. Both my mother and father were only children, and my father died when I was 25. My mother followed him about nine months later. I have no siblings, no cousins, nothing. It is me against the world, and I've grown used to that. My job is my passion, and the money I make helps keep me grounded that life isn't all bad, even if it seems that way. About six months ago, I had a decent amount of money saved, and I was tiring of my one-bedroom apartment. While it was nice to be able to put a decent sum of cash away each paycheck, I wanted something more. Another thing besides my job to help validate my time on this world. The next best thing to finding a companion was real estate, and having my own home would probably help in the endeavor to find a woman to share the house with, so I decided to start looking into the housing market outside of Chicago. When I arrived at this place, I instantly knew this was the house for me. It was a large, two-story building at the end of a dead-end road. Now, I'm a tall man, and the ceilings of each room in the house stretched up to at least nine feet, so it was perfect for me. Stairs led up to a second-story landing with two bedrooms and a second bathroom, perfect for someone who had an interest in a future family. The greatest thing about it was the price. For some reason, it was cheaper than any other house in the area that I'd seen. When I continually pressed the realtor about it during the showing, he finally relented that the previous owners, a family of four, had just disappeared. Police were called. Forensics swept the house, but it was like they'd just fallen off the face of the earth. It didn't bother me then, for I wasn't a believer in anything supernatural, and the price of the place was a steal. I bought it with no hesitation. It took me only three weeks to get completely moved in and settled. During that time, I was hardly ever at the house. The only times I was here was when I was dropping off boxes of my things from my apartment. And because of this, the warning signs that occasionally popped up about this place didn't really register with me. When I found a box of my things knocked over on its side, the contents strewn across the floor, I just assumed it had fallen over, and maybe I hadn't done a good enough job with taping the lid shut. Once, when I came by, I found all the kitchen cabinet doors open, but I just shrugged it off and almost forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds stupid now, I know, but I really had no belief that anything otherworldly existed, and well, you know what they say about hindsight. Finally, I was all moved in, and could call the house my home. It was then that I decided to go around and meet some of my new neighbours. I may be all alone on this earth, 
when it comes to family, but I'd like to think that I'm generally a friendly person, and I do have a lot of friends that come from a variety of backgrounds. I was planning on throwing a party soon to celebrate my first house, and not only did I want to get my neighbours folded into my circle of friends, but to alert them about the large number of cars that will be parked on their street the day of the bash. There are only two houses that really could have been called my neighbours. As I said, the house is located at the end of a dead-end street, and the street almost literally turns into my driveway. The two closest houses are on my right and left, both about a hundred feet down the road and facing one another. I hadn't had the chance to introduce myself to either of the occupants during the chaotic move, nor had I really even seen them at any point. One housed a family, as I guessed from the presence of a minivan in their driveway and a swing hanging from a large tree in their front yard. The other house was more of a mystery. There was no car, and the house didn't look like it was in very good condition. But the mailman stopped there every morning, and the mail wasn't piling up, so someone had to be living there. I decided to get the worst over with first and visit that neighbour before the other. After ringing the doorbell, I stood on the porch for what had to have been a couple of minutes. Finally, I heard some shuffling behind the front door, and it opened upon a dirty old man in a bathrobe, reeking of whiskey. I later found out his name was Henry, and he was in his early eighties. He'd been living in this neighbourhood since as long as anyone there could remember. As he looked me up and down, a grimace adorned his face. What do you want? he asked curtly. Um, hi, my name's Kyle. I'm your new neighbour that lives just down the street. I responded as pleasantly as I could, pointing to the house I now occupied. This seemed to make his scowl worsen. Huh. So you're the one that moved into Lauren's house, eh? Well, no use talking to you. You'll be gone within a month, well, if you're smart and lucky. I stared at him in shock as he shut the door in my face, and I could distinctly hear the clicks of multiple locks from the other side. Praying that my neighbours on the other side wouldn't be as bad, I was pleasantly surprised to find the Watsons the epitome of good neighbours. They were a young couple, Stephen and Jenny, with their six-month-old son, Malcolm. Stephen met me at the door and invited me in, where I met Jenny and Malcolm. We talked for a good half hour, giving each other some basic background on ourselves, then telling me about Henry and how good the neighbourhood has been for them. I informed them about the party to be held at my new house, and even invited them over, but they politely declined, saying they both weren't really into crowds. Instead, they invited me over to dinner sometime in the near future, to which I wholeheartedly agreed. As I was leaving, something Henry said nagged at the back of my mind, and I decided to ask Stephen about it. Uh, hey, did someone named Lauren ever own my house? I asked as I was stepping out the door. Stephen paused a moment, looking somewhat undecided about something. He eventually sighed and gave me a weary smile. I suppose I should tell you about it now, otherwise Henry will end up scaring you with his constant subtle warnings about it. Uh, apparently, around 70 years ago, a girl named Lauren grew up in that house. When she was 14, there was a robbery at the place that went bad. I mean, really bad. Everyone was found dead, but Lauren and her mother had... things done to them before they died, if you know what I mean. My eyes were growing wider with shock by the second, as Stephen continued his tale. Since then, there have been many ghost stories about that place, mostly about Lauren killing any man who lives in the house. I <laughs> can't say I believe any of those stories, but you're the first person who's lived in that house since we moved here, and Jenny and I moved in about five years ago. I didn't know what to say. I was too shocked about learning my new home's dark past to respond. Stephen tried to brighten the mood by laughing and give me a little pat on the shoulder. <laughs> no, right? Probably didn't expect to learn you're living in a haunted house when you came over earlier. Well, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. I've never seen any ghostly figures in the windows or blood-curling screams in the night. 
Personally, I think Henry, the one who told us about the house and its history, I think he fancied Lauren as a young man. He's told me his house is the one he grew up in, so I think he just doesn't want another man to be living in the house of his beloved Lauren. That kind of made sense, and it was better than trying to believe I lived in a haunted house. So I accepted Stephen's theory with a smile and a thanks. We exchanged cell numbers. He told me to call if I ever needed help with anything. I offered the same service, said my goodbyes, and began walking back to my house. As I got closer, I felt an ominous aura radiating from the place that I hadn't felt before. Something instinctual and primitive told me I was not welcome in this place, and I should leave as soon as I could. But I just reasoned that my brain was being a little spooked that I was living in a house that people were murdered in. For the next few days, leading up to my party, nothing of significant note happened. There were no spooky sounds or shadowy figures or disembodied voices, just normal old house noises. When the day of the party arrived, I found myself cleaning every corner of the place, and it seemed like the house had far more space than I'd previously thought. It was in a dark corner of one of my storage rooms on the second story that I found a loose floorboard. Curious, I pried it open and found a little storage space with a small wooden box. Opening the box, I was shocked at its contents. There was an old family photo of a man, his wife and their daughter. They were wearing old clothing, maybe from the 1940s or 50s. My gut sank as I realized who these people probably were. It's not often you get a glimpse of the truth behind a ghost story, to see the victims of murder and rape. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do next, so I simply put the photo back into the box and returned the box to its resting place, placing the floorboard back over it. Just before the floorboard completely encased the small storage place in darkness, something caught the light coming from the room and glinted. I paused and put the floorboard down and reached towards the shine in the dark. It was a necklace, a full moon made out of mother of pearl with a heart-shaped ruby right in the middle of it. It was beautiful. I stared at it for a moment, enraptured by its beauty. I snapped out of my trance quickly, however, and began to put it back where I'd found it. Taking it seemed wrong to me, like robbing a grave. A noise behind me made me pause in my returning of the necklace. I'd left the door behind me open, because why should I have closed it, when I heard the creaking of the old hinges, signalling the slow moving of the door. Before I could think about what was going on, I turned on instinct to investigate the source of the noise. The door was almost fully closed, but that wasn't what caused my mouth to gape and my eyes to bulge in horror and disbelief. In front of the closing door stood a teenage girl. She wore an old, dirty white dress, dark bloodstains covering the collar area and the crotch area. Her skin was paper white, whiter than the dress she wore. She had long, dirty blonde hair that covered her face. But just from the dress and the hair, I could tell she was the girl from the photo I'd just seen. On instinct, I crammed my body in the corner, staring at the girl in utmost terror. She didn't move or speak, and slowly the door behind her shut completely an audible click seemingly echoing around the room as the lock turned itself into place. That click was like a gunshot at the horse races. Her arms were suddenly raised towards me and she charged. Her motion parted her hair and I got my first look at her face. Her eyes were just dark pits that were even more black with the white skin that surrounded them, contrasting their inky blackness. Where her nose should have been, they were just two oval pits like there is on a skull. Only her skin was there, as if she had never had a nose at all, 
and the skin had just grown around the two pits. Her mouth was twisted in a large open snarl, with rotting teeth and blackened tongue flailing. Her screech, dear God, her screech. It was the scariest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I can't even think of something to compare it to. Nothing would do it justice. Imagine the scream of a dying woman, but now twist the terror within it with a dose of fury and add a dash of unholy laughter, and you might have something close to what I heard. I had mere seconds to react. An instinct took over. I closed my eyes and held my hands out in front of me to try and shield myself from this abysmal spectre. I thought I was going to die, and braced myself for something to come crashing into me with biting, tearing, strangling intent. Yet, a couple seconds passed, and then a few more. I must have had my eyes closed for about a full minute, and nothing happened. A bit of confidence came back into my thoughts. What the hell was that? I just had a major hallucination, like one that I'd never had before. After catching my breath, I opened my eyes. Her face was six inches away from mine. I screamed, expecting death right then and there, and yet she didn't move. She was busy staring at the necklace that was still in my grasp, in my right hand. I didn't stop screaming, and when my arms moved involuntarily as I struggled to blot her visage from my sight, she moved her head in time with the necklace. If she had eyes, I'm sure they would have been locked onto that full moon. As I sat there cowering, trying to force my body further into the wall in an effort to get as far away from her as possible, she started singing. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. The singing voice was just as frightening as her screams. But the fact that she wasn't attacking me and was singing calmed me down somewhat. Slowly, I began testing my situation a bit. I moved my hand with the necklace back and forth and I watched her move her face, following the movement of the amulet, not missing a beat with the song. I then got up, keeping my back to the wall and making my way over to the door. She only moved enough to follow the necklace with her head, but she never moved closer towards me. As I neared the door, I could tell she was getting close to finishing the lyrics of the song. I didn't want to see what would happen when she was done singing, and with a burst of speed, fueled by adrenaline, I ran to the door, unlocked it, threw myself out of the room, and slammed the door shut. I leaned against the door, breathing heavily and sweating bullets. I still wasn't completely sure what the hell had just happened. As I breathed heavily, with my weight fully against the door, I pressed my ear up against it and listened intently. There was silence coming from within. I kept my ear pressed to that wooden door for at least five minutes, desperately trying to calm my beating heart so I could hear the faintest of sounds coming from within. When I heard nothing, I steeled myself and opened the door just a crack to peer inside. The room was empty. No screaming demon girl or any trace of her. I opened the door fully and went back into the room to check the corners, and there was only myself in that room. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief, which was cut short when I noticed the floorboard had been returned to its original place, something I know I didn't do. I quickly closed the door again and decided I would never, ever use that room again. Now, I'm not a cliché horror movie character. I know what I saw, and I know I hadn't taken any LSD recently, or was drunk with my ass and hallucinated the whole thing. I didn't know what to do. 
I'd never experienced anything like that before, so I didn't know if I should call a priest or a witch doctor or a psychic or whomever. We also had a party that was going to happen in a few hours, and there was no way I could call everyone and tell them the party was off because a horrifying ghost girl had appeared in the house. For that night, I decided that I would just inform everyone not to go into that room for some reason or another, and I could deal with this whole situation tomorrow. Just for safety's sake, I fashioned a crude cross out of a large wooden spoon and fork meant for stirring up salads, and attached it to the closed door. I didn't care what my friends might think. I would just pass it off as a joke or a made-up thing my parents used to do in a new house, and I was honouring them. I was still worried when people began arriving, but as the night wore on, I was less and less concerned. Nothing supernatural seemed to be happening, and as the booze flowed and the house was filled with laughter and smiles and congratulations, my mind wandered from the possibility that my house was haunted. The few people I told about my afternoon situation laughed it off. Even when I told them I wasn't taking LSD or anything that could cause hallucinations like that, they said it must have been a waking dream or something. After a few beers and a few shots of whiskies, I agreed with them. After all, I'd never seen a ghost before, and neither had anyone I'd ever known. By 3am, all of my guests had said their goodbyes, getting safely driven home by taxis or Ubers or significant others. There were a few cars still parked on the street, awaiting their owner's return in the daytime, and one of those cars belonged to a very good friend of mine from high school. I hadn't seen him for about an hour, and I was a little pissed that he might have left the party without saying goodbye to me. I gave his cell a ring to give him a piece of my mind, but his phone lit up and began vibrating on the coffee table in the living room. Oh, this was very odd to me, as he ran a business, and his phone was always attached to him at the hip. He wouldn't be one of those people that would just forget his phone, even if he was drunk. Last I'd seen him, he wasn't very drunk at all, in fact. With his phone still on the coffee table, I thought there was a chance he was still in the house. Calvin? I called, getting no response from anywhere in the house. I went to the bottom of the stairs and called up. Hey, Calvin, you up there? At this, I heard a distinct thud of something falling to the floor. The traumatic afternoon incident came rushing back to me all at once and I reached into my pocket to grasp the necklace I'd placed in there hours ago. Step by step, I made my way up the stairs to the second story landing. Flipping on the light switch, the bulb in the hallway illuminated briefly, but with a loud pop, the bulb burnt out and left me in darkness. With my free hand, I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight. Looking down the hallway, I saw the door to the storage room slightly ajar, the makeshift cross gone. I swallowed audibly and slowly made my way to the door. As I got closer to the door, I began hearing some muffled cries coming from within. I wish I could have moved faster, been brave, done something other than what I did, but I was so scared and I was shaking, and every step I took was taking the full extent of my willpower. When I reached the door, instead of opening it, I peered in through the gap, keeping my phone's flashlight facing the floor, trying not to draw any attention to myself. There was a large, dark shape on the floor, seemingly struggling about, the source of the muffled cries I'd heard from down the hallway. I didn't see any pale white girl, so I decided to lift my flashlight to see what the dark silhouette on the floor was. It was Calvin. His hands and feet were bound by rope, and his mouth was stuffed with some white cloth, tied into his mouth with what looked like a ripped strip of white cloth from a dress. When the light washed over him, he looked up at me, his eyes filled with tears, but widening with hope at the sight of me. 
His cries greatly increased in volume and urgency, and his struggling heightened as well. I pushed open the door and began to make my way towards him, when something impossible happened. Like it was rising up from water, the top portion of the girl's head appeared from Calvin's back. Black pits where her eyes should have been, staring at me. It wasn't like the traditional idea of ghosts, phasing through objects like you've seen in movies and TV. Like the chest-bursting aliens, where her head rose from his back, a massive hole appeared, spilling guts and gore across the floor. Calvin screamed as loudly as the gag would allow and blood began seeping from his mouth, turning the white in and around his mouth crimson with his blood. Her head then rose far enough out of his body so her hateful grimace was visible, and with a voice like wind whipping through dead, dry leaves, she spoke over Calvin's dying gurgles. Give me my necklace like a shark fin sticking out of the ocean. Her face came at me just above the floorboards, her screams driving utmost terror into my soul. I fell on my ass in surprise and fear, and as I had earlier, my arm shot out on instinct. My right hand still held onto the necklace, and, like before, the girl's face stopped close to it and stared. After a moment, she began singing the same song she had earlier. I jumped to my feet quickly, and in one fluid motion, I slammed the door in her face. I stood there, panting, still shaking at the horror I'd just experienced. Did I just watch one of my oldest friends die from some ghost girl exploding through his body? There was just no way that was possible. Did someone spike my last beer with something? That had to be it. But why were there no other effects that I was experiencing? My mind was racing with questions and theories about what had just happened. A sound coming from the room drew my attention back to reality, and I placed my ear to the door to hear what the sound was. It was crunching. The sound of meat tearing, and the sound of blood splattering onto the wooden floor. My mouth fell agape as I realized what was going on. She was eating my best friend. I couldn't allow that to happen. I'd already failed him by not getting to him in time. I was not going to allow some ghost bitch to eat his corpse. Rage overpowered my reason and fear, and I pushed the door open, holding the necklace out in front of me in an effort to distract the ghoul while I would grab Calvin's body and drag him out. An empty room greeted me. There wasn't a trace of the gruesome scene I'd stumbled upon not a minute earlier. I flipped on the light switch and looked for anything. A drop of blood, a bit of bone, some strands of hair, anything. The floors were as clean as I'd made them when I'd swept and mopped earlier that afternoon. No sign of Calvin. No sign of Ghost Girl. I felt like I was in a nightmare and wearily made my way to my room, where I promptly fell onto my bed and went to sleep, thinking the whole thing may be this whole day. It must have just been some fever or coma dream. I woke up so hungover, I thought I would welcome death. I slowly made my way downstairs with the sun shining in like a bastard, making seeing a pain in the ass. Glancing at the clock on the stove as I made coffee, I saw that it was 11.30. I thank God I didn't have to work that day. Going to the main window in my living room to close the blinds, I noticed the cars that had been parked on the street the night before were all gone. All except for one car. The realisation of what that implied cut through the fogginess of my brain like a knife. I hastily got out my phone and called Calvin and heard his phone vibrating on the coffee table, where it had laid all night. A giggle caught my attention, and I whirled around quickly. A 
saw a brief glimpse of a white dress disappearing up the stairs with the sounds of bare feet thumping across the wooden steps. Well, that has been my life for the past few months. No one has entered my house since the party, except for the police. They were there to question me and look for evidence about Calvin's disappearance. I let them search the whole house, simultaneously hoping that they would find anything so I wouldn't go to prison for the rest of my life, and hoping they would, so I could prove to myself I was just going crazy. And my house was just a house, not a haunted one. All they found was the loose floorboard and the contents inside. I had to feign ignorance, and they took it away as potential evidence. But since they found nothing that tied me to Calvin's disappearance, they told me they would be in touch if they needed anything else from me. The removal of the box and photo only seemed to piss the girl off even more. Day and night, she would appear at random times in random places, trying to catch me off guard so she could kill me. Cabinets, closets, <laughs> the toilet, it didn't matter. If I seemed to be relaxing just a little, she would appear, her twisted face in a snarl, screaming for me to give her necklace back to her. I wore it around my neck now, and she didn't charge at me anymore, knowing I would just use it to put her in a trance and make my escape. Her plan now was trying to make my life not worth living. But oh, I'm not some pansy-ass weakling. I didn't have money to move, so I stuck it out, flipping her off whenever I saw her, even screaming back at her a few times. I was terrified every time I saw her, but now there was rage and hatred mixed in, allowing me to act in defiance. I refused to go to others for help, for I didn't know if she would follow me out of the house and hurt or kill the kind people who would aid me. A couple of times at work, I saw I could see tiny slips of a white dress going around corners or even disappearing into the ceiling panels. Everything changed earlier this afternoon, and it has led me to this doom I now face. This morning, the girl surprised me by rising out of a kitchen counter and made me spill hot coffee on my pants. My breaking point was reach from months of sleep deprivation, nerves being on edge, and I tore the necklace off its chain and shoved it in her face. I promised her, in a seething voice, that she would never, ever get this necklace back again. I swore I would smash it to pieces if I saw her even one more time. It was then that her eyes seemingly opened. They didn't open in the traditional sense, but out of the black pits that occupied her eye sockets, two normal-looking, even beautiful, green eyes appeared and stared at me, with her disgusting mouth twisted in a bemused smile. We'll see, she simply stated back, and disappeared back into the kitchen cabinet. She'd never responded back to me before, and I was in complete shock. I decided to walk outside and get some fresh air, sticking her necklace back into my pocket as I stepped onto the porch. It was while I was on my porch, still in my coffee-stained trousers, that I noticed Henry outside of his house, gathering his mail. I hadn't seen him in months, but I still remember his cryptic statements towards me when I first met him six months ago. He must know something, anything, about my situation. Why else would he have said that I would be out of that house in a month if I was smart and lucky? My frustration at my situation was forcing me to act, and so I ran up to him so quickly I surprised him. Holy fuck. Don't come up to an old man like that. I will shit my pants, he said angrily, taking a few breaths with me as I was catching my breath from sprinting over to him. He seemed to remember me and gave a bemused grin. Six months in her house, huh? You must be a fighter or a fool. Maybe one is the same as the other. I'm assuming you're coming up to talk to me again to find out some information about what's going on, eh? 
I ended up just staring at him hatefully. My life had been a living hell. My best friend had been killed, and this asshole has the balls to make light of my situation. Henry seemed to notice the rage oozing out of me, and his expression darkened. <sighs> What's been happening? he asked. Who is she? I asked gruffly. Henry straightened and looked me square in the eye. Her name is Lauren Morris. She and her mother and father lived in that house when I moved here with my family in 1942. I was eight years old when I arrived, and she was eight too. She was a girl ahead of her time. Feisty, quick-witted, strong and adventurous. She and I became fast friends, and we grew up together. Oh, she grew into a beautiful young woman. A flower among the fields of weeds in this area. He looked past me at my house and grimaced. <sighs> when she was fifteen. Yeah, I know. Her father was murdered and she and her mother were raped before they too were murdered. What does that have to do with me? Why is she tormenting me? I tried to be as calm as possible, but my fury could not be contained any longer. Henry just laughed. <laughs> because it's Lauren's house. How would you like it if someone just moved into your house and made it their home? <laughs> You'd do everything in your power to get them to leave, huh? She's never said anything about making me leave. I screamed in his face, taking out the necklace and shoving it in front of his eyes. All she's ever talked about was getting back this damn necklace. That's all she's ever wanted. This stupid piece of junk is the only thing that's kept me safe all these months. I shoved the necklace into my pocket again and grabbed Henry by the collar with both hands, my rage finally fully unleashed. <sighs> she killed my friend, Calvin. She killed him and she ate his corpse. How does that make her any better than her killers, huh? It doesn't make me want to move. It makes me want to burn the freaking house to the ground. Henry had first worn a mask of surprise and alarm at my outburst, but now his face was one of disgust and hatred himself. Take your hands off me now, he said quietly, venom coating every word. His reaction surprised me enough that I took my hands off his collar without protest, and he wiped where my hands had been like he was shaking dirt off. There have been six people before you, that lived in that house. Five of them were scared off, but only one was made to disappear. Turns out, after the police did some background searching, that guy was a serial rapist. My eyes widened in surprise, too shocked to make a rebuttal to what he was insinuating. Uh, I think I'm going to end our conversation now. Uh, don't talk to me again, Henry said darkly and turned away from me to walk back into his house. That freaking asshole. He's condemned me to death. I'm sitting in my bedroom typing this last will and testament because of him. He must have swiped it from my pocket when I was grabbing his collar, because now I cannot find the necklace anywhere. Lauren knows it too. For when I tried leaving earlier this night in an attempt to escape, when I realized how much shit I was in, she appeared in front of the doorway leading to the porch, her green eyes flashing and her infernal mouth twisted into a triumphant grin. I had no other option than to retreat into my bedroom, where I decided to write this out for everyone to hear. Okay, I'll admit I'm not a saint. Sure, maybe I was a wild kid in my late teens and early twenties. Okay, look, Calvin and I visited many nightclubs around Chicago. We did some drugs, drank a lot of shots, and, well, had sex with slutty women. Maybe there was a time or two we had sex with a girl who was so drunk she was barely coherent. But that's not me. I was drunk too. Why would a girl be at a club like that, drinking like she was, if she didn't want to have a random hookup? The moment I was told no, I would have backed off in an instant. Well, it doesn't matter. Any bad karma I may have against me will be offset by ridding this world of this house. 
and the evil girl with it. She kills people, which makes her no better than her killers in my eyes. I'm sure everyone else will agree with me. So, I've collected a lot of bottles of lighter fluid over the past months, because I've always had burning this place to the ground as a backup plan, and I have them all in my dresser next to my bed. Once I'm done typing this and sending it out for the world to see, I'm going to douse every wood service I can find in lighter fluid and send Lauren's house back to the pits of hell where it belongs. It's been quiet here, ever since her appearance at the front door, stopping me from leaving. But I still have to be cautious. And Lauren is smart and sadistic. She can appear from anywhere in her house, even from the bed I... So, a pretty classic ghost story for you there, but extremely well written and one that was a lot of fun for me to read. Let me know what you think in the comments section below and I'll join in the chat as soon as I can. Well, that's it for one more evening from me, but of course I will be back again very soon on Friday. Yes, these weeks just roll by so quickly, don't they? Well, enough for me for one evening. Till then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?